Good morning, everybody. Let's stand together. I'm going to read a scripture, and then we're going to sing a new song this morning. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, we're all familiar with it. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Kingdoms will bow. 
Yeah. 
this week. I'm still looking for some final flakes to fall this coming weekend, and I think we're done. Hey, for those of you who are looking for some devotional opportunities, we have a number of different uh, options for you to consider as you leave through the double doors and to your left. And then these just arrived. Uh, we've been doing daily breads here for years as well. And uh, so if you're interested in the March and April offering that we have here, pick those up on the way out. You'll see them in the rack through the double doors and to your left. Also, we kicked off our Warrington small group this week on Thursday night. So if you're looking to connect in small groups and you're down in the Warrington area, uh, the Young Hands are hosting that. The next one will be on the 25th of this month, and that's on a Thursday. We're going to be starting out every other week with them. And so if you're interested, uh, just contact them, contact us here at the office. And if you're interested in some of the other small groups, I think we have, a, I think we have nine total that are going on. Uh, please just contact us here at the office and then we can get you plugged in. Men's breakfast coming up next weekend. And gentlemen, you're not gonna wanna miss this. Uh, all the breakfasts are great. 
Uh, the speakers are fantastic as well. This coming month, we have Tim Cox. Tim uh, heads up a, a ministry called the Great Samaritan, and it's all about how he gets involved with dealing with the human trafficking industry and how we as Christians can not only pray, but be a part of being a catalyst to ending this horrific situation that is not only here domestically, but it's also uh, you know, a global pandemic as well. So that's next Saturday, 7.30 to 9. Tim will also be with us on Sunday, sharing a little bit more specifically about that particular ministry and those services. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed when you've pulled into the church facility, if you look to currently, if you're on, uh, let's see, it would be my left, your right, this side of the building kind of tails off. We've had to, to build up the property a little bit over the years to get this footprint for our building. That piece of property over there on that side is not real usable. It, again, it just kind of tails off pretty dramatically. But thanks to the genius of Julie Warner, Julie uh, approached me uh, about this time last year, and she said, you know, Kevin and I have been thinking about possibly putting a prayer garden together. And she put this whole design together, and I'm telling you, it is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, there's going to be trees and flowers over there. There's going to be uh, the opportunity to walk through and walk down. And if you're interested in not only seeing what we have laid out for us on the design, or talking to Julie, Julie, raise your hand, please. Talking to Julie specifically, maybe you would like to donate a tree or a series of flowers, maybe for a family member, a loved one. And that would be a place where people can just go and they can walk through there, they can pray over that, and uh, just enjoy being on a piece of the property that's kind of quiet and uh, is really going to be looking awesome here over the next couple of years. So if you're interested in that, I've got the drawings right up front, and you can talk to Julie right afterwards. And we're gonna, you're going to just see this transformed here over the next year or year and a half or so, and uh, we're looking forward to that. So Julie, thank you, and thanks for approaching me about that. And then for the remainder of the month, we'll have, uh, again, Tim Cox here next weekend, and then on the 28th, we'll have Palm Sunday, and it will just focus our attention on what the essence of that means as we prepare our hearts for Resurrection Weekend, which is the 4th of April. And uh, right now, the weather's looking pretty good. I looked at the long range, and it would be fantastic if we could do all three services outside. We'll kick off with a sunrise service at 7 a.m., and then we'll do our 9 o'clock and our 10.30. We're going to try to do them all out front like we did last year. The 7 a.m. service will be a little bit more intimate. We'll have everybody close in with the, uh, with the chairs. We'll have a much smaller meal. Well, the focus of attention this morning is on communion. And we'll have the entire sermon focused around that, and then we will participate together. And to share his heart with us on communion from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is Philip Rice. Many of you got to meet him last fall in September when Barb and I took a few days to get away and get out of North Carolina. It was one of those... Uh, a bit of an unusual situation. I talked to Kevin Worsham at Fresno Valley Christian School, and I said, listen, you've got some of these fine young men that are teaching at your school right now. Is there anybody over there that you might recommend to come in and, and spend a little time with us while we're out? And he's got, he says, this guy, Philip, you know, he's a little wiry, but I mean, he might be interested in coming over. Well, sure enough, he was gracious enough. He and Brenda and their children came by, and you know, he shared the word, and and that developed into a, a, a deeper relationship, not only personally, but as well with the church. And by the grace of God, you're going to be seeing uh, more and more of him in the coming uh, weeks and months. He and his family will be moving from the Luray area uh, over into Marshall, probably towards the end of the summer into early fall. And once that happens, uh, they'll be here on a more regular basis, and he'll be interfacing with our teenage ministry, young men, uh, preaching more as well, and uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to reach out and meet he and his wife Brenda and their five children as uh, they get more acclimated to the Marshall area. So at this time, I'd like to bring Philip up, and uh, he's going to share the word and talk to us about what God's doing through communion. Great. Philip, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Am I on? Um, open your Bibles with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, I'm just going to read the passage and then pray and kind of and jump into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're gonna, I'm going to read from 17 through uh, 34, just so you see the, the full context. Um, we're going to focus primarily on 17 through 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. <clears throat> but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry. Another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No. I will not, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. Then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. Without the other things, I will give directions when I come. Well, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your church and your people, for worship songs, for giving us tangible things that we can feel and taste and smell. Thank you for being a God um, of glory and of beauty so that um, we can uh, glorify you by, by making beautiful gardens um, and singing songs um, with melody and harmony. Father, I pray that you would shape our thinking, that we wouldn't impose what we want onto the text, but we would submit to what you say about um, the Lord's Supper or communion. And Father, if there's anything I say this morning that's off, help it to be forgotten or even challenged later. But if what I say is true to the word, Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Um, your word never returns void, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we, we haven't really been in 1 Corinthians, and um, as those who are in my Bible class know, ad nauseum, you, you always set the context. Um, and so, 1 Corinthians is a bit different of a book. Most of Paul's book, he, he outlines a, a, fairly long, a, a fairly lengthy theological, reasonable, um, this to that uh, kind of logical argument, and then because of what is true theologically, how ought we to live? That's, that's generally how the Apostle Paul writes most of his letters. 1 Corinthians is, is a little bit different. It's kind of just like a, a Q&A with Pastor Paul. Um, he, he wrote a number of letters to the, to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was, was messy. Um, uh, it had problems, like all churches. Um, and so Paul is, um, it, you don't really have to see, you have to understand if, if you look to the left, you'll see head coverings, um, and if you look kind of to the right of this Lord's Supper passage, you'll see a topic on, on spiritual gifts, and um, I just don't want to do anything that looks like we're, we're looking at this out of context. I, I want us to read everything he has, however, I'm, I'm not going to cover everything in that passage. There's so many huge things. 
Uh, what does it mean to examine yourself? What does it mean to be, to be judged? Um, what does it mean for uh, the different factions that are going on? And I'm simply, I'm just going to acknowledge that that's there and not going to cover it. What I want us to focus on is where ought our mind be fixed when we come to the Lord's table. And so if, if you hear nothing else from me, if you hear nothing else, here's the main point, and then I'm just going to walk us through the text to get there. The, the main point is that when we come to the Lord's table, when we eat the bread and drink the wine or the grape juice, that we do that in remembrance, that we're fixing our minds, remembering Christ, specifically looking at verse 26, that in doing that, when, when we come together as a body of believers and we celebrate communion of the Lord's Supper, that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. That we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing. That's where our mind um, ought to be fixed. So uh, let's just walk through the passage beginning in 17. Um, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. What, what's going on here? Paul is, is clearly communicating that um, division in the church is not the way it's supposed to be. Division isn't the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be unified. But he also acknowledges that sometimes division is necessary. Sometimes uh, um, people are professing things that the Bible is just clearly saying no. Um, in 1 John chapter 2, uh, he, he tells us, um, if you're denying that Jesus is the Christ... Um, you're not a, a Christian, that we need, to div we need to have some lines that are worth dividing over. So Paul is acknowledging that this division in the church, that um, the division isn't the way it's supposed to be, um, but not all division is wrong. Does that make sense? And then, and then going on. Um, uh, 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 we just read 18, 19. For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Imagine how messy of a church service that is. And Paul, Paul is still addressing them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and just like on a side kind of pastoral note, um, one reason people struggle with the church is because they've been hurt within the church. It's life in the church is messy. In the book of James, we see that, um, imagine if like all the chairs weren't the same, but we had like really nice lazy boys up front. And then we had like stiff wooden pews in the middle and then we had floor space in the back. And based on how much you gave to the church was like if you got the lazy boy or if you had to stand in the back. That was essentially one of the things going on that the Apostle James is saying, no, that's not, that's not the way it's supposed to be. But he's still addressing them as brothers and sisters in Christ and saying that this is, this is not what we're supposed to do. And so there's, there's division. Some people are getting drunk. They think that, oh, the volume of wine I consume, maybe that'll get me close to God. Maybe the volume of bread that I eat. And they're not seeing the people next to him. And he's saying, that's not communion. You're missing the point. That this is something you do together. This isn't just about filling your belly. This is an aspect of worship that we do together. Um, and so one of the things that kind of divides the church um, today, just on a, on a theological note... Um, there's a few different views of the Lord's Supper, um, or the, the Eucharist, as some denominations call it. Um, some think that when the words of institution are spoken, that they physically transform in their essence, maybe not in their accidents, whatever they mean by that, if you want to go down that theological rabbit hole. But it's, it's with it, when you eat the bread and drink the wine, you are actually eating the literal flesh and blood of Jesus. And that therein is the efficacy 
That's the Roman Catholic position. That's called transubstantiation. We don't believe that. We deny that. Okay? Um, there's kind of a, a middle view. When Martin Luther broke from the Roman Catholic Church, um, he would talk about how it's, it's not physically transformed, but the body of Christ is present in, with, and under the elements. Um, and, and that's called consubstantiation. We don't hold that. Um, as, a, as a church, we hold to a, a symbolic view of the elements. That Christ, yes, is present by the Holy Spirit. When two or more are gathered, he is, he is there with us in a unique way. Um, and so Christ, yes, is present, but he's present by the Spirit, not in some weird, literal, mystical way. And so if, if there's two errors that, that I want to discuss as, as we come to the table... Some people come to the table thinking that there is this, this mystical efficacy of the Lord's Supper, that it, it physically becomes the body and blood of Christ, and therein uh, is, is, it's good for your soul. And then uh, if, if one is kind of a, a more mystical um, view, um, another is just a miserable view. For, for some people, when, when they come to the Lord's table, um, it is, uh, it's so somber and downcast, Example, is there any sin I've forgotten to confess? Is, is there anything? And, and thinking through, examining yourself, that's a good thing. But, but let's see how Jesus would have us practice the Lord's Supper. Continuing on in verse 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. I received from the Lord what I delivered to you. Paul is, is going to start out and tell us about communion that this isn't something that he's just kind of making up as he goes along. That worship isn't something that we just, we just make up as we go along. That communion, this, this Lord's Supper, that this is something that Jesus commands us to do. And th there's other traditions in the church that are good. I love Advent season. I love the church calendar. I, I love the difference between Advent and Christmas, if you really want to get into church calendar stuff. I love Lent and looking forward to it. And these are ways um, that we, we celebrate the beauty of the miracle of the Incarnation. And we celebrate um, the cross and then the resurrection. But brothers and sisters, those are our ideas, seeking to be faithful. And, and they're good. Please hear me. I, don't hear me uh, putting down Christmas and Easter, but, but those are the traditions of man and us seeking to glorify God with with how we do holidays. Communion is not. This is not our idea. This is God's idea. And so as you think about things like Christmas and Easter and you think about communion, these, these need to be in slightly different categories. Verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, when he had given thanks, when he had given thanks, every gospel includes this, that Jesus is instituted the Lord's Supper and it begins with thanks. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. He wants them to remember him. Why do we need to be told to remember? Because we forget, if you're like me. We need our minds focused and reiterated uh, month in and month out, week in and week out, on the, the truth of the cross and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you forget you know, sometimes it's, it's just kind of sin um, and righteousness, but sometimes we're, we're, all, we're, we're finite people. We forget. We get busy with life. And what's one thing that communion does? It helps us to remember the central event of human history, the crucifixion of our Lord. We'll, we'll get to that. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, there's a, a lot going on there when he says covenant. 
Um, and, and we're not going to unpack that fully, but kind of covenant is, is for another sermon. But just re- remember this, that that covenant relationship, relationship is a huge part of covenant, that your union with Christ came at a great cost. It came at the cost of his body in a torturous death being broken like the bread, his blood being spilled like the wine or grape juice being poured out. And he wants us to remember that. Our union with him came at a great cost. And then herein is the main thing. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, the the as often uh, phrase there, um, he's not saying it has to be weekly or it has to be monthly or it has to be yearly. He's he's saying when you do. And so how often it gets done, um, that's not the main point here. The main point is is that when you you do this, when you eat this bread and drink this cup, that what are we doing? Well, it says you proclaim, and, and if you have a pencil... If you don't mind me, uh, part of me wants to edit the language here. Um, and, and I trust Pastor Chris will agree with me. That you there in the Greek, it, one of the things I don't like about English is the second, the lack of the second person plural. Um, the country folk get it. Um, and, and in most of the letters, um, most of the you's are plural. This says y'all proclaim. <laughs> That's what it's, I mean, if we had a better word, I would use it. But y'all proclaim. It's one word together, the the y'all proclaim. And that proclaim word, that's the same word. A few words are used for what prophets and preachers do. But that's one of the words used for what, what preachers do when they get up and preach. What prophets do when they get up and prophesy. And what heralds of the king do when they're bringing news and they are shouting it out loud in, in the square for all to hear. How do we proclaim? How do we share the gospel, both with ourselves and with the world? How do we do this? One of the ways that Jesus says that we proclaim his death is in coming together and remembering the cross, remembering the broken body, the shed blood. We remember his death, his his atoning sacrifice. And in some uh, church circles, they'll, they'll want to think of, um, they, they famously change, oh, what's the name of the song? One of the lines, um, they'll change it to, God's, on the cross, God's love was magnified. And, and that's true. That's absolutely true in the cross. But also in the cross, God's wrath is satisfied. And so week in and week out, when we fix our minds on the cross, we need to think, Why was the cross necessary? Why was the cross necessary? Because God is holy. And I am not. The biggest exposure of my sin happens on the cross. That's what it took. That that was the penalty of my sin. And I need to, as I think about how bad my sin is, I need to not just compare myself to others, but look at the cost paid to reconcile me to God. But but the cross is not just this thing that, that weighs us down. It also lifts us up. Because the great exchange happens there. For all those who are in Christ, your sin goes to the cross. And the righteousness of Christ It's accounted to you, and you are credited as righteous before a holy God. And that is why we can come to the cross, and we can remember broken body, shed blood with thanksgiving. And so when we come, when we remember, when you fix your mind at the the communion table, when you eat the bread or the wafer for now, and drink the wine or the grape juice for now, think of Christ, remember him. Where does the verse end? You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Are you eagerly waiting for that day? Our king has come and he's ascended, but he is returning. And he will come with power. And, oh Lord, haste the day when our faith is made sight 
The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. The Lord shall descend. It is well. It is well with my soul. For those who are in Christ, oh, what a wonderful day that will be. But we cannot assume that everyone here really knows Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so that day for them will not be wonderful. For Christ comes as king. He comes in power, sword from his mouth, white robe, baptized in blood. On his thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords. What will that day be like for you? Are you eagerly weighing that day? Celebrating and thanksgiving for the, the triumph of our Lord Jesus Christ. Joining in the worship of him. Do you know Jesus? If you do, come to the table. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. Remember him and celebrate him. That's what communion's about. We proclaim his death until he comes. Fix your mind on him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let me pray for us and then transition. Father God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your son, the creator of the cosmos, walking among us, living the life that we should have lived, dying the death that we deserve because of our sin, but who has been raised in triumphs over Satan, sin, and death, and who is right now interceding on our behalf. Thank you, Father. Father, I pray that for those who come, that they would come by faith, and that they would be nourished, and that they would remember the cross with thanksgiving, and eagerly proclaim your death until you come. And for those who don't, Father, I pray that maybe even today that they would seek you by faith, that you would breathe life into them by the power of your Holy Spirit, that they would ask to talk with Pastor Chris or one of the elders, that they would know you personally. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, thank you. I'd like to have Jamie and Gail join us up front. Sam and Jackie, I'm going to bring you up too. I'm going to change things up a little bit. Great. Jamie and Gail are going to take this side. Sam and Jackie will take this side. We have the two seats on either side too. So because of COVID situations, uh, you're going to receive the elements that have both the bread and the cup as one. And you're going to have to tear the top off, and you'll have the bread, and then you'll tear it off again, and that will reveal the cup. Now, Philip did talk about wine. Uh, we're not going there yet, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be offering you the grape juice side will be over here, and the wine side will be over here. Uh, it is all uh, grape juice around uh, you know, the whole time that we're uh, going to be serving this together. So when you get this, just wait for me when these guys come back up to the front, and then we will participate and partake together. All right? And then while they're passing these out, uh, Dolly will be playing and singing a gospel song for us.
Outstanding reminder that we come to the table and we remember and we celebrate what he's done for us. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus also took the cup when he had shared this message with his disciples. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I have to admit, I'm going to look forward to the time when we can get back to doing communion the normal way, when we're not tearing things off. But in the meantime, uh, this works well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie and Gail. Thanks, Sam and Jackie. You guys may be seated. I'd like to invite the music team back up to close us out with just a, a great song of remembrance as well, just focusing our attention on the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. Why don't we stand? sing that together.
online who have joined us as well, and we trust that you were prepared online to have had communion with us today. Uh, next Sunday, we're doing it all over again, 9 o'clock and 10.30. Remember, Tim Cox will be joining us. Men's Breakfast is next Saturday morning right here. You can sign up online, or you can just give us a call here at the office. This is a great thing. Listen, for teen guys, you guys right here, I don't know what you're doing next Saturday. I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Uh, this would be good for you guys to be here as well, so think about that for your schedule. Have a great rest of the day, an awesome week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks.